Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in electrochemistry. I hope that you've had a good weekend and that you are ready for our lesson on <laughs> electrochemistry. Okay, so as you can see, the computer has decided to get a little bit ahead of me. So we're going to be talking about electroplating and there are two examples here. So let's talk about what electroplating is. Electrolytic cell can be used for electroplating. We're talking electrolytic cell. Electrolytic cell, remember, is the one that has a power supply and we're forcing the reaction, okay? The definition, the process of coating an electrically conductive object with a thick, that's supposed to say thick, my apologies, layer of metal using an electric current. The reasons to electroplate, well, Firstly, aesthetic reasons, as you can see from the pretty snail over here. Um, um, it's not a real snail, obviously, um, but it has been covered and I think it's a copper coating. So it's just really to make things look pretty. Aesthetic means um, for visual reasons, okay? Corrosion protection. So for example, your keys, 90% of the keys that we use that look copper aren't actually copper, they're just copper plated. 99% because copper is quite soft. Um, so you don't really want to be using it. Um, so what they do is they force the copper to cover the key. I mean, obviously they stop the reaction when the key is totally covered. It can also be used for abrasion and wear resistance, a similar type of thing. When you want to protect a piece of metal um, from a wear and tear or abrasion, abrasion means um, rubbing or friction, then you can coat it in a, th a thin layer of a stronger material. Okay, so for example, a lot of times the jewelry that we're using or have is not actually um, gold. Okay, it might be gold plated. You need to be very careful, look very carefully at the stuff that when you buy them, grade 12s. If it says gold and you don't look at it very carefully and it's only like very cheap, then it chances are it's actually gold plated, which means it's got a very thin layer of gold over a cheaper metal underneath. Okay, and then in the production of jewelry. Okay, so electro refining, however, is electro plating on a large scale. And that's really what we're going to be talking about in today's lesson. So copper plays a major role in the electrical industry. It's more important than actually covering pretty things. Um, it is very conductive. Copper is one of the most conductive metals um, and therefore it's used in your electrical cables. In fact, if you ever went to go along and splice through a cable, please don't do this unless you, you were meaning to do it. You'll find that the cables are copper. They're like that bright orangey goldy color. Okay. One of the methods used to purify copper is electrofining copper ore into blister copper, which is then refined into copper using electroplating. Okay, now that sounds very complicated, so don't stress. There's a pretty picture. Okay, so what happens is your copper is um, impure. Okay, it's got zinc, it's got nickel, it's got iron, it's got copper, it's got tellurium, gold, and silver. Okay, and what happens is that it is placed in a so what they do is they mine it, okay, and it's called blister copper, and the reason it's called blister copper, okay, admittedly this picture doesn't show it, but usually what happens is it's got this ore, okay, and the ore will be black, okay, let me draw this properly. So the ore is going to be black, okay, or black or grey or silver or whatever, but then what you will see is these little, um, you know, like a blister pack, okay, it'll actually be sticking out, there'll be a blister pack of blisters of copper sticking out of this ore. So you can see the ore, the copper sticking out of it. Obviously there's copper inside as well, but you can definitely see it sticking out. So that's why they call it blister copper. So they have a bar of blister copper or impure copper and they connect it to the anode. Okay, the anode. So what happens at the anode? Anode is anox. So oxidation occurs at the anode. So what is oxidation? Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Loss of electrons. And grade 12, which way do the electrons travel? Do they travel through the solution or do they travel up the wire? They travel up the wire. So electrons move up the wire towards the positive electrode. So in other words, they connect this to the positive electrode. 
Okay, the cathode is made up of pure copper, and this is what people need to understand. You need copper to make copper. Even if you have a teeny, teeny, teeny sliver of copper, you have to have a teeny sliver of copper before you can get your cup, make more copper. Okay, so you need copper to make copper. Okay, so, I mean, if you want pure copper the whole way through. So what happens is this is made of pure copper, and obviously it's connected to the negative end of the battery, okay? So then the electrolyte, is usually copper sulfate um, and possibly some sulfuric acid. The reason for the sulfuric acid is just really to make it slightly acidic and if it's acidic then basically it's going to um, allow free ions to move through a little bit more easily. Okay, so do you agree that you're gonna, this copper sulfate is going to break up into copper 2 plus and SO4 2 minus ions? Okay, that's what's happening here. Okay, so the current passes through the cell, la, 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 makes this nice and negative, okay? And what happens? As it makes it nice and negative, this, so this gate is oxidizing, and oxidizes to form copper 2 plus ions, okay? So the copper 2 plus ions, so this is what happens on this side. This becomes, on this side, becomes Cu, goes to Cu2 plus, plus two electrons. That's what's happening on this side, the left-hand side, okay? And the Cu2 plus goes into solution. Ta ting okay? So now there's a greater concentration of the copper 2 plus ions in the solution, okay? At the same time, this bit here is becoming more negative because of this transfer of electrons. So then what happens is, and we'll talk now, is that, yeah, this is the cathode. And what happens at the cathode? The cathode has reduction, which is a gain of electrons, okay? Therefore, there's a gain of electrons, becomes more negative. And what happens is you have your Cu2 plus, plus two electrons forms copper. So any copper two plus ions that are close to the surface, okay, so it's not necessarily the same copper two plus iron, okay, please understand that, okay, that basically a random copper iron, copper atom breaks up into a copper iron and set gets put into the solution. Another random copper two plus iron gets attracted to this negative electrode to form copper. And then this actually is going to decrease in mass. It decreases in mass. And this is going to increase in mass. Okay. So it's going to keep going until this reaches the end. We finish the end. Okay. There are other metals, you don't have to worry about the zinc, the nickel, and the iron, okay, but what you do need to worry about are the terillium, the silver, and the gold. These here yeah, form an anode, it's called an anode slime, okay, and they love asking about this, and I will explain it to you because I will go through some exam paper questions, but they like to say to you, why is it that the silver and the gold and the tellurium fall at the bottom and they don't react and join onto the copper? And it's all to do with where they sit on the redox table and which year is more reactive, okay? I mean, as in which is more likely to be reduced. And the answer is that the copper 2 plus ions are more likely to be reduced than the... I mean, the copper 2 plus ions are more likely to be reduced than all of these, okay? So that's why. And then obviously your silver, golden, and your tellurium form a solid sludge at the bottom, which is great because that's one of the ways that we can get out the other metals, okay? And then obviously we need to clean these up, but that's not our problem for the electro refining of copper. Okay, so that's electro refining of copper, but that usually, by the way, it doesn't look like this. It usually looks like this. And let me see if I can draw this for you. Um, usually it's on a much grander scale. So it would be blister pack and then solid and then blister pack and then solid and then blister pack and solid, get the gist, okay? And then these dudes here would all be connected to the cathode, okay? And then just to put it in a different color so you can see what I'm doing, these dudes here would all be connected to the anode, okay? And then basically this would be on a large scale. So, and then all of this would be, have some copper sulfate solution, okay? Um, so it'd be CuSO4 solution. And there'd be little piles of sludge or slime under each of these. Okay, so this here is a simplified version 
of that over there. Right, let's carry on. So now let's talk about the cloud or alkali industry. So here's the tricky thing, okay? Great 12s, the electro refining of copper, the electro refining of aluminium, and the chloride alkali industry are officially not part of your curriculum anymore. Okay, officially. However, <laughs> they can ask you about it with respect to the electrochemistry. So that's what they do. So even though the chloride alkali industry, the refining of copper, and the refining of aluminium are not officially in your caps. Okay, if you look in your caps compared to the previous curriculum, they'll say you don't have to know it. But if you look at the exam guidelines and you look under electrochemistry, and that's why I keep saying to you guys, you need to learn your exam guidelines and we'll read through it carefully and tick off everything to make sure you know it. The chloride alkali industry needs to be, you need to know your electrochemistry with respect to the chloride alkali industry, the copper refining and your aluminium refining. So that's why I'm going through this with you. So please make sure you understand it. Okay, so let's talk about chloride alkali. Chloro alkali okay what does that mean to you it obviously produces chlorine chloro and the alkali is sodium hydroxide okay so this produces oh i don't like green okay so this produces cl2 so chlorine and sodium hydroxide and both of these products are very important we'll talk about the importance of them in a second but they do this through the electrolysis of raw brine okay so I've written down the definition of brine because a couple of years ago, one of the examiners decided to give away some marks and they said, what is brine? And the number of students that could write and say, well, it is sodium chloride in water, okay, or a aqueous solution of sodium chloride. It's table salt in water, okay. It's sodium chloride in water, the saturated aqueous solution of sodium chloride was very low, the number of students that could work, which was very devastating to the examiner. So now we make sure that you all know it, okay? Um, if you've ever bought tuna, <laughs> go look at the tins of tuna. It'll either say um, tuna in brine, which means salt water, because that's exactly what this is. It is salt water. Or it will say tuna in oil. Okay, and it's up to you which one you want to buy. But the point is that those are your options. Okay, so go look for that. And if they don't say salt water, they will say brine. And brine means salt water. Okay, so chlorine is used first of all to purify water. Guys, you know this. Okay, typically, typically, if you've ever smelt a pool that has just had H2H -H put into it or any of its cleaning agents, it'll smell like chlorine gas, okay? But here's the tricky thing. If, if they ask you what is chlorine used for and you say to clean pools, you will get zero marks, okay? They are very specific about that. It's not to clean the pools, it's to purify water. Um, one, of the, one of the small ingredients in your H2H or your other ingredients for your chemicals for cleaning a pool is chlorine. There are many others, but to clean the pool actually isn't the chlorine function at all, but it is to purify water. So if you want to go hiking and you want to stop and you want to drink some of the water and you're not sure if the water's clean, you can put a chlorine tablet and it'll purify the water. It can then obviously be also be used as a disinfectant to clean stuff. And it's also used in the production of hypochlorous acid, okay, hypochlorous acid, which is used to kill bacteria in water, okay? And it's used in the production of a number of things like paper and food. Okay, and this is just also another thing that I found very interesting. Um, a colleague of mine, ex-colleague of mine, his husband used to work in a paper recycling company or for, he was one of the main engineers. And he used to say to her that, that people misunderstood the recycling of paper. And he, although it is good in the sense that we are reducing the waste products in the full and reducing the amount of trees being killed or broke, yeah. Um, the problem is that they are quite toxic um, chemicals used in the recycling and production of paper. And one of them is chlorine. So you need to be careful of what you choose 
to do with things like that. I'm not saying recycled paper is bad. I'm just saying that you need to read all the facts before you decide which way you're going to go. I recycle paper, um, but there's different recycling methods as well. Okay. So it's also used in the production of antiseptics and insecticides. Oh my word, I don't know where I was when I was typing this insecticides. I apologize again. And it's also used in paints and plastics, okay, paints and plastics. And when we talk about, I just realized I haven't taught you guys um, polymerization. When we talk about polymerization, we'll talk about plastics and paints, or plastics and chlorine. Okay, sodium hydroxide is used to make soap and other cleaning agents. In fact, bars that included mainly sodium hydroxide were the original soaps. Okay, to purify bauxite, so which is the ore of alum aluminium. And guys, we're not American, so it's not aluminum, it is um, aluminium. Okay, and we're going to talk about bauxite a little bit later when we talk about um, the purification of aluminium. And again, it's used to make paper. And like I said, it's one of the toxic ways that we can make paper. Make rayon. What is rayon? It's silk-like material. So um, a lot of times, like your underwear, if it's not made out of nylon, it'll be made out of rayon or silky pajamas or something like that. It kind of feels like silk and looks like silk, but it's a cheaper version and it's man-made compared to silk, which comes out of a silkworm's bum. Okay, right. It's not quite out of its bum, but you know what I mean. Okay, right. So now let's talk about the mercury cell. Now there are three cells that are used. When we say cells, a cell is basically, think of it as an electrolytic cell, but on a really big scale. Okay, really big scale. Think like size of building big. Okay, so now there's the mercury cell, the diaphragm cell, and the the mercury cell, the diaphragm cell, and the, I've gone blank, the diaphragm, and the, I'm going to get there, membrane cell. <gasps> Sorry guys, membrane cell. So we're going to talk about all three of these cells, and I'm going to go through their functioning very carefully, because at least one of them will probably come up in your exams, if not in the prelims and the finals. So we're going to go through it nice and slowly and make sure that you guys understand it. Now, the mercury cell was the original of the type of cells to make be used in the chloroalkyl industry. And the mercury cell is actually so toxic to the environment that no longer produce, make it. They have agreed to maintain the mercury cells okay until they die out okay in other words if there is one that's currently um being used then the agreement is that they will maintain it okay because it's actually better for the environment to maintain it than to try and shut it down but but um, they're not building any more of them because of the fact that there's mercury and all sorts of other things which we'll talk about okay so the way it works the anode is the carbon electrode suspended from the top of the chamber. So there's a whole bunch of anodes, because like I said, this is a really big thing. You're looking at the size of a house, a small house. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of big carbon electrodes that are suspended from the top of a chamber. And these are the anodes. So it's connected to the positive end of the battery and they're positively charged, okay? And what happens at the anode is oxidation and oxidation is a loss, okay, so it's a loss of electrons. The cathode, interesting enough, is a liquid mercury that flows along the floor. So the cathode is actually the mercury that flows along this, okay, and it's a liquid, okay. The electrolyte is brine, the sodium chloride solution. So the electrolyte is the sodium chloride solution. And notice it's a solution, which means it's in water, which is important because where do you think we're going to get our OHs from? Okay, so it's in water. When the electric current is applied to the circuit, the chloride ions in the electrolyte are oxidized at the anode. Okay, so what happens here is the Cl minus ions, okay, are attracted to the positively charged things and the two of them and they give off the electrons to form chlorine gas, two electrons, okay? And then chlorine gas escapes here, okay? Right, happy with that. 
Then what happens is, and there's your equation, 2Cl minus goes to 8Cl2 plus 2 electrons. At the same time, your sodium ions are reduced at the anode to form solid sodium. So over here, the Na plus gains an electron to form sodium. And what happens is the solid sodium dissolves in the mercury to form a sodium mercury amalgam. Now, when they say dissolves, I want you to think kind of like solid lava lying on liquid lava. Okay, it's not a pure dissolution process in the sense that you can separate it out almost with a sieve. Not quite, but you can. Or if you've ever had um, the old fashioned um, custard and there's like a skin on it at the top, that's kind of what you need to think of, okay? So it's kind of within the mercury, but it's kind of like little, or even like a lava lamp, think lava lamp, okay? Where there's globules of it, okay? That's what an amalgam is, okay? It's not a pure proper dissolution process, okay? So make a solid, so they make a sodium mercury amalgam, okay? So then, like you said, it's, it's, it's not actually a proper thing, so it's got brackets, it's NA bracket HG. That's what it means by that bracket, it means it's an amalgam, okay? The amalgam is poured into a separate vessel. Here it is, it goes into a separate vessel, where it decomposes into sodium and mercury. So how does it do that? Well, what happens is we've got water here. Okay, water's pumped in at the bottom. Okay, and as it pumped in into the bottom, okay, it cools the sodium and mixes with the sodium and mercury amalgam. And the water breaks up into H plus plus OH minus ions. And the OH minus ions join up with the sodium to form sodium hydroxide. And the H plus ions join up with themselves to form hydrogen. So in fact, out of the mercury cell, we get Cl2, we get H2 and we get our NaOH. And all three are very important products. Okay, we've spoken about the CL2 and the, the sodium hydroxide. The hydrogen is important because it is a source of fuel. Okay, it's a source of fuel. Um, but there's something very important. Okay, chlorine and hydrogen, if you put them close together, they actually go boom. So this is a very good structure in the sense that the chlorine, where the chlorine is expelled and where the hydrogen is expelled is two very different areas. So there's very light, little likelihood of them mixing and going bum. So that's actually very good about this diagram. Okay, so there we go. The sodium reacts the water in the vessel and produces sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And then the mercury returns to the electrolytic cell to be used again. So what I want to do is, um, just a second, no, it's this one, hang on a minute, I got a little animation going, I just need to get to an arrow, oh, I know, oh, sure, but sorry, there it is, okay, so what I've got is, if I can get it to go there, um, yeah, is a very nice animation of how your mercury cell works, okay? So there's your mercury, this is the first part of it, yeah, your mercury comes in, okay? Yeah, are your anodes, which are your carbon anodes, okay? This is the saturated brine, which is the sodium chloride and water. So now what happens is the sodium, a sodium chloride breaks up to chloride minus ions and to Na plus ions, and the what hap and then what happens is the H2O just carries on as it does. Okay, then what happens is that the chloride ions get attracted to the positive electrode. They give off the electrons and they form chlorine gas, which bubbles out. Okay, and then the, this bit here flows out as depleted brine. Okay, it's depleted so, uh, salt water. And then what happens is they tend to just put that back into the ocean because these are usually come straight from the ocean because they use ocean salt water. But if not, then what they will do is they'll push it back into the concentrated version, saturated and send it back through. Okay, now at the same time, the sodium plus ions, okay, you can see them over here, the, little, the pink things. I wonder if I should make this a bit bigger so you can see it a bit better. 
Okay, there we go. The sodium plus ions get attracted to the cathode, the negative cathode, and they go in with the mercury to form a mercury, silver, I mean sodium amalgam. Okay, then they get into there, yeah, okay. And they go over here and they get into the water. Okay, the water's pumped in here. And there's graphite in between it, but that's just really to um, slow the process down. It acts like a sponge almost, okay? So then what happens is the water goes in and gets absorbed by the graphite and the mercury and the sodium go through it. As the water, the graphite's almost like an electrode, okay? But it doesn't actually have anything connected to it. It's really just like a sponge. Okay, so what happens is the water breaks up into your OH minus ions and your H plus ions, okay, like we said. And then the hydrogen ions join up together to give off hydrogen gas, and there you go, it goes off. The sodium hydroxide ions join up with the sodium plus ions, and they go off here, and you can see you get 50% of your sodium hydroxide. And the common name for sodium hydroxide is caustic soda. And then the mercury goes down here, and it's not perfectly clean. There is a bit of brine in there still, but it's pretty clean. And then it gets pumped back up, and there you go. So that's how the mercury cell works, okay? So, okay, it says mercury film forming the amalgam. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so that there is what is going on with the mercury cell. Okay, pretty cool, hey? Okay, right, now. Okay, so... Overall reaction is that your sodium plus your mercury amalgam plus your water, that's what's happening down here, break form sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen plus mercury. Okay, so that's the mercury cell. So now the only advantage to the mercury cell is it's quite cheap. That's the only advantage, okay? But it also produces a fraction of the chlorine and sodium hydroxide that's used in industry because of the disadvantages. Firstly, mercury itself is expensive. When I say the mercury cell is cheap, I mean cheap to maintain because once the mercury is in it, 90% of the time the mercury stays. If their product is good and their maintenance is good, 99% of the mercury is reclaimed every time, more than 99%, okay? But mercury is highly toxic and can get into the environment, okay? Some mercury always exca oh, escapes with the brine. With the brine. I'm going to get someone to actually check my spitting for now. Brine that has been used. Okay, so some mercury always escapes the brine. And if they're not recycling that brine, then obviously the brine is going to get out into the ocean and, and then the mercury is going to get into the ocean and that's when we get mercury poisoning of our fish, which is actually pretty bad. Okay. The mercury acts with the brine. <laughs> to form mercury to chloride, which is really bad as well. And the mercury cell requires a lot of electricity. It requires a lot of electricity, but all of the cells require a lot of electricity. The one that carry, requires the least is obviously the last one, but which is the latest version. But all of them require a lot of electricity. The other thing the mercury cell does is, unfortunately, it gives off a lot of heat. And because of that, it in it changes the environment, the local ecosystem, which is, of course, bad. So, although chlorine gas is very pure, mercury has to be removed from the sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas mixture, obviously. So, now let's talk about the diaphragm cell. So, next step was the diaphragm cell. Okay, the problem with the diaphragm cell we'll talk about in a second. But the diaphragm cell was the next step, and it was the next, it's pretty good. Okay, the last one is the best version okay and we'll talk about the differences in a minute okay but what happens here this time you've got a porous diaphragm divides the electrolytic cell into an anode compartment and a cathode compartment okay i'm going to tell you what's wrong with it this this diaphragm is made of asbestos and asbestos is really really bad for you asbestos long-term exposure of asbestos causes asbestosis and asbestosis is basically what you can get in it, it's basically what happens is you abs you breathe in the asbestos which is very very fine powder very fine powder it's not always fine powder but um, the part the problem with asbestos if it's a solid form if you just bump it okay it'll come off in tiny tiny flakes tiny bits okay so then what happens is the asbestos gets absorbed into your lungs and forms tiny crystals on all the alveoli of your lungs, which means over time you can no longer um, breathe in oxygen because all your alveoli become covered. And it's actually terrible 
terrible illness and you end up um, very ill and in fact eventually you drown. You drown in your, your, your lungs full of water because you can't get rid of it. Um, because every time you breathe out, I hope you know that you also and breathe in, there's water vapor happening and obviously if these alveoli, alveoli aren't working you cannot actually so you suffocate and you drown it's a horrible disease okay so this is why diaphragm cells are not really any longer being used and they gain to, they gain to be replaced or they are being in the process of replacing and they're busy replacing these diaphragms with the membranes okay and it's not a very expensive thing to do in comparison with breaking down the cell entirely okay so that's what they're doing so the diaphragm cells are slowly being replaced with membrane cells. Right, the porous diaphragm divides the electrolytic cell into an anode compartment and a cathode compartment, okay? Brine is introduced, yeah, at the anode, okay? And flows through the diaphragm into the cathode compartment, okay? So it flows into it, okay? The electric current in the anode through current, the electric current into the anode through the brine, causing the salts, chloride ions, and sodium chloride ions to move. Okay, so what happens is, because this is positively charged, sodium, remember this is saturated brine solution, okay? So it's NaCl plus your water, all right? This bit here has just got water in it, just got water in it, okay? But now what happens is that the because of the way the anode this functions, okay, the chloride ions are attracted to the positive electrode. So chlorine gas gets formed. So on this side, you've got Cl minus, oh, Cl minus, two Cl minus, goes to Cl2 plus two electrons. So that's what's happening on the left-hand side. The sodium plus ions with the water move through the diaphragm. Okay, and over here is the cathode. Now, think about this. You've got water, which is broken up into H plus and OH minus ions. You've got the sodium plus ions. Okay, yeah. So what happens is the hydrogen plus ions get attracted to the cathode and they form hydrogen gas. So you end up getting H plus plus two electrons that's two H's to form H2. And that's the hydrogen gas that's given off here. What happens is then the sodium plus ions join up with the hydroxyl ions to form sodium hydroxide. Okay, and you'll notice here that that's the problem. 12% of this is sodium hydroxide and 16% is the original sodium chloride. So it's not a very good removal of sodium hydroxide. So then what happens is you can either have a separation happening or what they do is they send it back through and they do it again. Okay, so that's what happens to the diaphragm cell. So let's watch the diaphragm cell. Okay, let's go through to the animation and oopsie, there it is. So here we go, we've got saturated brine, which again is your sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride solution, and it is pushed into or led into the anode compartment, which is positively charged, okay. The sodium chloride obviously breaks up into Na plus and Cl minus ions, okay. Let me just move this down a little bit so you can see what's going on, okay. So the chloride minus ions are then obviously attracted to the positive anode and they give off electrons using C, 2 Cl minus goes to Cl2 plus 2 electrons and they form chlorine gas which gets expelled on this side, okay. The diluted brine, okay, which is a little bit of brine but all the sodium plus ions and the more the water go through the permeable membrane. Notice it's permeable. Permeable means it lets everything through, okay. Permeable, all right. What happens here is your, so your water breaks up into hydrogen plus ions and hydroxyl ions, okay? Then what happens is the hydrogens, obviously because the water breaks up to form hydrogen plus hydroxyl, the hydrogen forms gas and that goes off there. So now we've got our chlorine gas and our hydrogen gas, awesome. Then what happens is you've got diluted sodium hydroxide and diluted brine. 
now get pulled off over here. Okay, they get sucked along here. They move along there. Okay, and it's a pressure thing. Okay, it's purely pressure. High pressure here, low pressure there. That's how it makes. That's why this level here has to be higher than that level. And in fact, they like asking that. They'll often say to you, why is this level higher than this level? And it is because of the fact that this is using the pressure of the water to make it go through. Anyway, so then you've got dilute caustic soda and diluted brine go through there. And then two, one of two things can happen. Like I said, either they'll allow you to, um, either they'll allow you to, uh, it'll be either sent back into the system or or it will be going to go through separation and everything else okay right so chlorine gas is produced at the anode okay we've got that at the cathode your sodium ions react and you get sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas right so now advantages and disadvantages your advantages are that it uses less energy than a mercury cell awesome what else? It does not contain toxic mercury. Duh. Okay, the disadvantages are the sodium hydroxide is less concentrated, not as pure. Do you see? We saw that it was what? I think it was 12%. Yeah, 12% of sodium hydroxide. So it's very impure. Um, the chlorine gas often contains oxygen gas as well, which is a problem because that needs to be separated out. And the process is less cost effective as a sodium hydroxide solution needs to be concentrated and purified before it can be used. So with the mercury cell, they actually, to be honest, the mercury cells, they usually put them next to the ocean and they just suck in salt water from the ocean, okay? Whereas with this one, they actually need to use concentrated and purified sodium hydroxide solution. So they can still use ocean water, but they need to concentrate it out and purify it to make sure it's just or mainly sodium hydroxide. Okay, now let's talk the membrane cell. So, sorry, another disadvantage which you need to add in is that the diaphragm is made of asbestos. diaphragm and that causes asbestosis causes asbestosis okay so what happened then is that they said okay well we can use the same principle except that this time we're going to use a semi permeable membrane oh, let me try again semi permeable membrane and what does that mean it means it only lets some things in semi-permeable means it only lets some things in okay notice also there's something interesting here is that these levels are equal and that's because they're no longer using pressure they're using concentration things are going to travel from a high concentration to a low concentration okay so let's go through it so it's very similar to the diaphragm cell but the main differences are the two electrodes are separated by an iron selective membrane rather than a diaphragm what does that mean it means it lets through specific ions okay and other ions it doesn't allow through so you can see the membrane structure allows cations cations are your positive ions Okay, to pass through it between the compartment cell, but does not allow anions to pass through it. No negative ions. Okay, so what happens is the brine is pumped, concentrated, and pumped through into the anode. Okay, only the positive charge sodium ions get to go through. Okay, the chloride ions stick around here, and they join up at the anode to form chlorine gas. Okay, perfect. The cathode compartment contains pure water. Awesome. So then what happens at that point is that the positively charged, okay, we said this, then at the negatively charged cathode, the hydrogen ions, exa exactly the same thing, the hydrogen ions in the water reduced to form hydrogen gas, exactly what happened. And then the hydroxyl ions join up with these positive sodium ions that have traveled through to form sodium hydroxide solution. And you'll notice two things. One is that you've got here yeah, 30% sodium hydroxide solution. There's no sodium chloride to speak of. Well, there isn't because it didn't get through. So that means that that's going to be a much cleaner and then obviously they can put it through a system get out the water okay and then you end up with your 50% sodium hydroxide solution so the 
chloride ions cannot pass through, so the chlorine does not come into contact with the sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide is removed from the cell. Okay, so let's look at the animation. Just looking at my time. Okay. Exactly the reason for the liquid here are the same height. So they're not using a pressure gradient here. They're not using from a high pressure to low pressure. They're actually using a concentration gradient. So what happens is this is going to be, this time as well, the, what happens is, yeah, you shove in saturated brine. Before, it used to all be flowing this way, right? Because we're talking about a concentration. Now what happens is you put in your saturated brine here, brine, and your sodium chloride ions break up into sodium plus ions, which go through the semipermeable membrane, where the chloride ions get attracted to the anode and form chlorine gas. And your depleted brine goes back through there, where it gets reconcentrated and shoved through here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, the sodium plus ions, re okay, the water again breaks up to form hydrogen gas and leave you with hydroxyl ions. Okay, there it is. And that's on the redox table, by the way, this formula, this equation's on, all these equations on the redox table. Which leaves you with hydroxyl ions. These hydroxyl ions then react with the sodium plus ions to form your caustic soda or sodium hydroxide, okay? And there you get 3% of caustic soda coming through. And you'll notice that there's pure water being pumped through here, and then there's a little bit of sodium ions that get in here, so that's why you've got 30% caustic soda here, and then it's got diluted and it comes back through here, where it gets cleaned up and you end up with 33% of caustic soda, which isn't actually a very bad percentage at all. So the winner is obviously the diaphragm cell. Okay, I mean the membrane cell. Obviously the membrane cell. Um, and let me just quickly, quickly, quickly go through the advantages and disadvantages. So, okay, the advantages are sodium hydroxide produced is very pure. Okay, 33% doesn't seem that pure, but it is pure. It's just not concentrated. 33% is the concentration. It's kept separate from the sodium chloride solution, so you don't have to worry about it. It's got a relatively high concentration compared to the others. I mean, if you think the other one was 12%, this is pretty good. Uses the least amount of electricity of all three cells. It's cheaper to operate than the other two cells and does not contain toxic mercury or asbestos, asbestos to form asbestosis. Okay, and that's it, grade 12 for today. We will carry on with the purification of an extraction of aluminium tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Cheers.